All right. Um, well, welcome to the first class of contemporary economic policy issues for Ali at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I'm going to start off telling you a little bit about myself, um, a little bit about Need, the nonprofit, and uh, and my my reason for being here. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what the the four classes uh, of this cor course hold in store for you. And then we'll we'll uh, start talking about the U.S. economy, talk a little bit about inflation, what the Federal Reserve is doing, and and how generally the U.S. economy is doing. All right, but first, um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I have a PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. Uh, I, uh, my bachelor's degree is from Wisconsin, so I got my PhD at Michigan, and then I went and I taught at Purdue for a little while. Um, and then honestly, it was time to get out of the Big Ten. Uh, so I, I left Purdue University. I went to Washington, D.C. for a number of years, worked for the Council of Economic Advisors, Federal Trade Commission, um, and then I moved out here and worked for uh, the, the, the think tank, the Public Policy Institute of California. Since then, I founded uh, and, and left uh, an economic forecasting firm that was very successful. Um, we actually forecast uh, the Great Recession uh, before the vast majority of economists did. So it was very good to us before it was very bad to us, right? Everybody wanted us to do work, but eventually everybody ran out of money. Um, I've been an independent consultant for a while. I do some, some litigation consulting, so I testify in court cases for lawyers. Um, and for the last five years, I've been primarily running um, my, uh, my new baby, uh, NEED, the National Economic Education Delegation. So NEED is a nonprofit, a nonpartisan nonprofit that I started um, a, a, almost five years ago now, um, out of, largely out of my frustration with, with politicians. Uh, increasingly, I've come to the view that politicians are using economics as a, as a weapon for their own agenda rather than as a tool for social good. And I would rather they use it as a tool, tool for social good. So I started thinking about, you know, why is it that they get away with that? And I, th I think the reality, the conclusion that I came to, um, that's be been reinforced since I started this, is, is that the electorate simply doesn't know very much about economic policy issues. And that honestly is not a knock on the electorate. That's a knock on the economics profession because we know a ton. It's our job to know a ton and figure out a ton about economic policy issues. Um, and part of our job, I figure, is to tell people what we know, but we don't historically do that. In the economics profession, we learn stuff about economic policy issues, we publish it, publish it in esoteric journals, and we move on. So need is my effort to get economists out of their ivory tower into the wild, telling people what we know about important economic policy issues. I've gotten a fair amount of buy-in. Um, from the profession. We have an honorary board of 54 members, uh, not the least of, of which is Janet Yellen, our current Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and Ben Bernanke. Uh, both Janet and Ben are the prior chairs of the Federal Reserve. We've got six former uh, chairs of the President's Council of Economic Advisors uh, under both D, Democratic presidents, and R, Republican presidents. And then we've got some Nobel Prize winners. We also have 652 what I'll call sort of rank and file members of the delegation. And those are, those are all PhD economists, largely academics, who help us write the slide decks, right? So when em any, whenever anybody gives a talk for need, they use a slide deck, uh, they use a common slide deck. So whenever anybody gives a talk on climate change, uh, they, they will use the same slide deck that anybody else will, will use on climate change. And so the slide decks are written by subject matter experts. They're also reviewed um, by subject matter experts, one of which is identifiably liberal, the other is identifiably conservative. And it's only the stuff that they agree on that goes into the slide deck. So there's a, there's a joke out there somewhere about how short our slide decks are, but in reality, um, we can go on for a couple hours on, on pretty much any topic. So a lot of buy-in from the profession. We have uh, members of the delegation all over the country. And here is a list of most of the topics on which we speak. There are some others that I should add. Um, but I, I, I like to put up this slide um, to, to, to maybe pique your interest in more need talks and also to offer an invitation. And that invitation is that if you're a member of any other group that, that brings in speakers, Rotary, Kiwani, Chamber, um, what have you, um, our, our talks are uh, generally free. Um, now, if you're uh, bringing us into a big corporation, we do ask for a gift, um, but in general, our talks are free. Uh, we, can do, we can do talks on any of these topics or, or others if you'd like to explore that. So that's, that's my invitation to all of you. All right, let's, let's uh, get into the course a little bit. 
Um, the course is Contemporary Economic Policy, and these are the four topics that we'll be discussing in the next four weeks. Today, I'll be giving an economic update. Uh, next week, you'll have Trevor O'Grady in to give a talk on climate change economics. Uh, and then Roger White will come in from Whittier College. He'll give a talk on the economics of immigration. And then I'll be back in the fourth week to, to give a talk on autonomous vehicles. And um, so I, I hope you'll, you'll stick around for all of those. Um, Trevor will talk next week uh, about what's going to happen to wine growing regions. Um, Napa may not survive through, uh, through 2100. I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen in the Santa Cruz region, but the Bordeaux, Burgundy and Tuscany areas are all going to be struggling uh, if we don't do something about climate change. And then Roger White uh, will be in to talk about immigration and he'll dispel some, some myths some myths around immigrants taking jobs, some myth, myths around immigrants um, just taking money out of government coffers and not contributing, and some myths uh, about immigrants and crime. Uh, pr they'll provide you the economic perspective, or rather I should say the perspective of economics, of economists uh, on the immigration issue. Uh, and then we'll talk about autonomous vehicles, which may not immediately seem like a pressing economic policy issue, uh, it's it's you know it's it's a part of uh, of sugar, and um, it's a really fun topic. But there are some very important economic policy issues uh, with autonomous vehicles coming. It's possible that 10 million jobs will disappear, um, and that is a, a pressing economic policy issue. Um, in terms of questions, um, I guess while I'm presenting the material, since there are so many of us on, it would be helpful if you have a question, clarification, or otherwise, please put it in the chat. Uh, and I'll glance over at the chat from time to time and try to handle questions as they come up. Uh, and also, also leave about 15 minutes at the end uh, to do to clean out the chat and to do a verbal Q and A if uh, any, anybody has any any questions, comments, or thoughts. Um, but for now, uh, and I also want to, to reiterate that I'll be putting these slides up on the Need website, uh, and I'll I'll send a link to the slides and to the recording uh, to Lois uh, probably later today when the recording is available. And then you can all have access to your, to, to your heart's content. All right, so let's move on to uh, the economic update. Um, what are we going to talk about? Well, first, I want to give credit where credit is due. I, I am not the sole author of this deck, though I am one of them. Scott Bayer, the chair of the uh, Economics Department at Clemson University. Jeffrey Waglum, who is emeritus from Amherst College. Brian Dombeck at Lewis and Clark College. And Doris Guida Stevenson from Weber State all had a, had a hand in putting this together. So what we're going to do uh, first. I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. economy, give you some perspective on it, its size and and its composition. Then we'll talk about uh, the notion of recession. Uh, I'm sure that that many of you have heard people talk and use the R word. Um, I'll give you I'll give you my reasons for not being that concerned uh, about a recession. I'm not concerned about the po uh, po the probability of a recession. Certainly a possibility, but I don't think it's uh, uh, necessarily going to come true. We'll provide some global comparisons. Uh, spoiler alert: things are are going the same, about the same way in the United States that they're going in uh, on in a lot of our peer companies countries. Then we'll talk uh, in a little bit more depth about inflation. Then we'll talk about the policy responsible to the pandemic and to inflation. All right. So first, some some basic statistics uh, about the U.S. economy. Um, it is big. It's very big. Uh, we have a population of about three hundred and thirty three million. <clears throat> About half of those, 164.7 million, are in the labor force. And let me say what I mean when I, when I talk about the labor force. The labor force is a count of all of the people in the economy who want a job, who, are, who either have a job or who are actively looking for a job. If you want a job, but you're spending all day riding your couch, then you're not counted in the labor force. And if you don't want a job, you're also not counted. And if you're less than 16 years old, you're also not counted. So it's people age 16 and above who are in the labor force. Uh, of those 164.7 million, 152.7 are employed, have a job. Uh, in, a, in a little bit, we'll talk about where we are in terms of jobs in this country. Uh, are they coming back? Uh, how quickly uh, have we recovered our pre-pandemic losses and have we gotten back to where we should be? I'll talk about all of that. Uh, and gross domestic product is the most common measure of the size of the economy. It's the most frequently talked about whenever there are GDP releases, the New York Times and, and the Wall Street Journal rush to produce uh, uh, the stories. GDP at the end of the second quarter of this year was about $24.9 trillion dollars. 
making the U.S. economy, I'll show you in a minute, about a quarter of the global economy. Income per capita, if we took all of the income that was generated by the economy um, and spread it evenly across everybody, we would generate about $65,000 worth of income. And presently, our average hourly earnings uh, for most uh, production workers is about $32.36 an hour. Okay, so let's put the U.S. economy in a little bit of global perspective. What I've got here is U.S. nominal GDP. What I mean by nominal GDP is that it's not adjusted for inflation, right? So it's not strictly appropriate to compare the Q4 2019 level of GDP with the Q2 2022 level of GDP, right? We expect this number to be bigger because of inflation. And in a little bit, we'll talk about real GDP. Uh, not that there's a fake GDP out there, um, but real GDP or real income or real anything uh, just means that it, it's, uh, the statistic is adjusted for inflation. But I think it's kind of interesting to show what's happened to nominal, not inflation-adjusted GDP during the pandemic. Right? So this 2019 Q4 number, that's the last number before the, the pandemic set in in the first quarter of 2020. By the second quarter of 2020, GDP had fallen by about 10% down to $19.5 trillion. We've since recovered our pre-pandemic level and we're significantly above it. In about 10 minutes, I'll show you um, where I, I think we should be and, and how we're doing in terms of making up lost ground. Right, so let's put the US GDP in international perspective. Um, so this pie graph over here shows you that the United States, the US economy is about just a little bit less than a quarter of the global economy. China's economy is about 15.5%, Japan about 5.7%. Um, and it's, it's really the top 23 countries that make up about 80% of the economy and 173%. 173 countries make up just 21%. Right, so economic activity is really pretty heavily concentrated, uh, A, in the United States uh, and B, in the developed world. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the composition uh, of the U.S. economy. And here I've got a, a set of sort of the most prominent industries. And for, for those of you uh, that add up numbers, these numbers won't add up to 100 because I've left off some uh, categories like other services. Right? That, that's just a hodgepodge of auto repair shops, nail salons, uh, hairstylists, and, and housekeepers, and a wide variety of different things. Um, these are the categories that I, I find that mo <clears throat> most people are curious about. And it turns out that, that manufacturing, right, we hear a lot about manufacturing and how it's in decline. Um, if this were a longer talk, I would get into how manufacturing is really not in decline and it still makes up about 11% uh, of US GDP. Um, retail sales is only about 5%. Leisure and hospitality about, uh, I'm sorry, 5.8. Leisure and hospitality about 3.2. Uh, other major sectors are information. It's about 5.6%. And, and I find that living in the, in the Bay Area, most people have a really outsized notion of how important the information sector is. It's, of course, very important locally, but it's not um, that important nationwide. Finance and insurance, about 8.6%. Professional scientific and technical services, 7.8%. Uh, uh, education, just one2 And healthcare is another 7.4%. So that's uh, how the industries. Uh, uh, compare in terms of their share of overall GDP. In terms of employment, I find it's also really interesting to look at that at the same time that we're looking at GDP. So the first thing to note is that uh, the employment share of manufacturing is just 8.5%, whereas its share of GDP was 10.9%, right? So that's where manufacturing is in decline. I said employment in manufacturing is in decline, and it's becoming a very... Uh, capital intensive, very robot, robotic intensive uh, industry. And it's been shedding jobs for most of the last 40 years. Over on the other side of the spectrum, uh, remember the healthcare GDP, share of GDP was just 7.4%, <clears throat> but the actual employment share in healthcare is, is about 15%, right? So it's a very, it's much more labor intensive, not terribly surprising, but much more labor intensive part of the economy than is manufacturing. Okay, so that's a little, little glimpse um, and into the U.S. economy. Now let's get into some, some more nuts and bolts, and let's talk a little bit about the likelihood of a recession. 
Right, so, so here's the here's a headline that was in the New York Times shortly after the the first estimate of second quarter GDP came out, um, and it was negative. Uh, it, it, every every quarter there are three different estimates. There's a first estimate, second, and a third. The first estimate comes the month after the quarter. The second is two months after, and the third is three months after. Um, and the the estimate after the first. Uh, the first estimate was that GDP in the second quarter fell by 2.2% after it fell by about minus 1.6% in the first quarter. So that gave us two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, which uh, a great many people are very quick to say, oh my gosh, that's the definition of a recession. Well, it's not. It's not the definition of a recession. It takes a lot more than that. Um, you know, you need broad-based uh, injury to the economy. And one of the things that we'll talk about and I'll show you is that employment in the U.S. economy is still growing at a pretty rapid pace, right? And economists are loath to look at employment growing at a pretty rapid pace and declare us to be in recession. But we'll talk more about that. All right. So let me show you quarterly GDP growth, right? Um, so this graph on it, the, the blue bar is going up. That indicates quarters where GDP growth was positive. And the red bar is going down, that indicates quarters where GDP growth was negative. Now, the first thing that I want to address um, is that this is the second quarter of 2020, right, where all the reports were the GDP fell by 30%. Right? When it's, it's more correct to say that it fell at a rate of 30%, that is to say it's reported on an annualized basis. And what it means to report something on an annualized basis is to say that if the economy were to grow or shrink at the rate it did in this quarter for a whole year, this is what would happen, right? So if the economy had shrunk for a whole year at the rate it did in the second quarter of 2020, we would have lost 30% of GDP. But over the course of that quarter, we only lost about 8% of GDP, Right. So this is one of the statistics, this is one of the things that, that's often reported, but, but not that well understood. So I like to you know, maybe belabor it just a little bit. Right. And over here, uh, we've got the, the last two quarters, uh, Q1 of this year minus 1.6 and Q2 of this year. This, that is the, the second estimate. Um, now, actually, it's the third estimate now. Uh, GDP in the second quarter was down minus 0.6. All right. Let's take a look at the trajectory of GDP through the pandemic. Now this graph is using real GDP, uh, so it's inflation adjusted. We can compare where we are, where we were in, at the end of the second quarter of this year with where we were before the pandemic. So before the pandemic, GDP was about $21.8 trillion and GDP has fallen the path of this navy blue line, right? It fell a little bit, which, which, was, which was startling at the time. It fell a little bit in the first quarter. It was startling because it was really only March and the quarter is January, February, March. It was really only March um, that was impacted by the pandemic, but it was impacted so significantly, dragged the whole quarter down. And then April, May, and June were a catastrophe. If you recall back to then, we got stay at home orders. We went out to get groceries and very little else. Right? And then we thought, uh, thought we were, might be in the clear. So we largely bounced back in uh, the third quarter uh, of 2020. And then well, we got slow growth in the fourth quarter because it came out too fast and we had more variants coming out. I apologize, I don't remember exactly the timing of all the variants, but we, we grew not steadily in, in fits and starts through the end of 2019. And then these last two data points, this is the first quarter of this year and that's the second quarter of this year. We've been in decline for this year. This red line, that is my forecast going back and using data from 2019 Q4, that's my forecast for what GDP might well have been in the absence of the pandemic. I use that to say that's where we should be relative to where we are, right? And when, when we recovered our pre-pandemic level, that's when the blue line intersected with this black line, right? the newspapers and everybody wrote stories about it and got all excited, but I don't care very much. What I care about is, is where we are relative to where we should be now. We're about 0 0.6 trillion above where we were, but we're still about 0.6 trillion below where I think we should be. So we still have some ground to make up. We have ground to make up not only in GDP, but also in employment and in the size of the labor force. We'll talk about that. All right, so we got two quarters of decline. 
why do we get that claim? Well, there's a there's a, a, a an identity in economics. Um, every first year student in macroeconomics is taught that y equals c plus i plus g plus exports minus imports. So y is GDP, and it's determined by c consumption plus i investment plus g government spending. And then this is just accounting. We want to take credit for the exports that we sent out, um, and we want to not take credit for the imports that we bought. Right. So easiest to th just to think of, of consumption, investment, and government spending is really driving GDP. It's really driving the economy. Well, consumption uh, is the major category in the C plus I plus G. It accounts for uh, about two thirds of economic growth. Right? Investment and government are much smaller, investment is second in size, and it has a number of different components in it. Right? You might not think of housing uh, as contributing to investment, but it is. We, we put it in that category. When new homes are built, uh, it's, it's included in investment. Uh, when businesses uh, you know, build a new factory or buy new plant and equipment, new equipment um, they're making investments. And then there's inventories. And I'm going to emphasize inventories for a minute because I think they're actually playing a really large role in our having had negative GDP growth in, for sure, the second quarter of this year. Right? It turns out, right? So GDP is gross domestic product. So it's really a measure of what we produce in a given quarter, in a given year. So it turns out that if we produce a lot of stuff, and we stash it away in warehouses, right? We're just building up inventories, right? And so building up inventories contributes positively to GDP. If you draw down those inventories or you build them up at a much slower rate, then that dra draws down GDP, right? So what's been going on in the investment category? Well, housing markets are slowing significantly. They were red hot during the pandemic. And for the last year, interest rates have been going up pretty rapidly. Uh, the 30-year mortgage rate is now, I understand it, uh, approaching 7%. It was at around 3 when we started. Um, because of uncertainty in the economy, business investment is getting slow. And then in the fourth quarter of last year, we built up a ton of in inventory. I think producers overestimated or were overly optimistic about the Christmas season. So at the end of the year, they're left holding the bag on a lot of stuff. Well, at least in the second quarter of this year, and I'll show you that in a minute, second quarter of this year, uh, producers drew down inventories very significantly. Like that means that they produced a lot less and they sold out of inventory. And it's that producing a lot less that causes that caused GDP to go negative. With regard to government spending, we'll talk more about this towards the end, but the federal government threw about $5 trillion into the economy over the course of 2020 and 2021 and all of that spending, all of that pandemic-related spending, came to a, a screeching halt at the end of 2021. So in early 2022, we're suffering from the fact that government spending has slowed. And as government spending is a driver of the economy, that has encouraged the economy to slow a little bit. And I really don't have much to say imports and exports. Uh, that's all that important. All right, so let's go back to the question of recession. All right, again, it really depends on what's driving the drop. Right, inventories, housing, and government sp government spending; those are the three most significant categories of contributions to the to the negative GDP growth. Consumer spending is still pretty strong. I'll show you that in just a second. Employment growth is also strong, right? And other indicators are are, are showing strength and stability. So I'll show you some of those. First, let's let's look at consumption. Um, and this is kind of like the GDP graph that I put up there uh, earlier. Um, but what this is, is this is, if we had GDP growth uh, of 5%, this tells you how much of that was driven by consumer spending, right? In uh, the second quarter of this year, we had GDP growth that was minus 0 0.6. And that means that there had to be something else out there that was counteracting the positive force of consumer spending. And those something else were, uh, were investment, government spending, um, and housing markets, right? So consumer spending has been contributing positively. It contributed pretty significantly to growth in the second quarter of this year, but inventories did not, right? This is what offset all of that consumer spending. Remember, consumer spending 
contributed 1.38, and inventories were negative 2.63. You add those two things together, um, and there were some other positive forces, but the, the decline in, or the drawdown in inventories in this quarter uh, was, let, was what led us to show negative GDP growth, right? And I'm inclined to say that that's just a pandemic fluctuation, right? The pandemic threw all kinds of monkey wrenches into our economy. And you can see, if you go three quarters back, there's this really tall bar. That's the fourth quarter of 2021, where producers were too optimistic and they filled up all their warehouses and didn't sell all the stuff. So inventories contributed very positively to GDP, right? And then now they're just, they're just selling off those inventories. So they're not producing very much and we get negative GDP. Once those inventories are drawn down and I think they did a pretty good job of it in the second quarter, then they're gonna start ramping up production again. Okay, so, so that's part of my take on GDP growth. I wanna show you this other indicator. This is industrial production. And I know um, I actually, I worked with Janet Yellen at the, at the uh, President's Council of Economic Advisors. And this was something that she always tracked very carefully, right, industrial production. It's basically the production of tangible stuff by the economy, right? Um, all of the manu all of manufacturing is in there, utilities and the, the energy that it, that's produced is in there, and then mining, all of the stuff that we pull out of the ground is also in there. And, and this index, it's an index of economic activity in, in the sector. It is higher than it has been at any point in actually the last 30 years. You can go beyond the end of this graph, graph and see that that part of the economy is doing pretty well. And it's a pretty important part of the economy. Now let's take a look at, at employment. I mentioned to you that I thought employment was still going strong. Well, this is the monthly change, month over month change in employment in the US economy. We can go back here to the late 2000s, to the aughts, um, and this is the global financial crisis, these red bars. And I remember I, I, I started my forecasting firm right about here, right? And then boom, we were hit with the recession and we were just oh, every, every month, wide-eyed at losing 700,000 jobs a month. We thought that was horrendous. Now that's a, that's a, that's a molehill relative to the mountain of job loss that happened in a single month of 2020. Right? This is April. In April of 2020, we lost 20.8 million jobs. Now we did bounce back pretty quickly and we're doing a reasonably good job of getting employment back to where it should be. All right, let me zoom in on the, on the last part of this, just the, the recovery following that really bad month. All right, so that was April and May, we had two and a half million, June, four and a half million, you know, and then, and then we got, you know, hit again a little bit with the pandemic and, and employment growth started to slow. And it has been, you know, mounting a comeback. Uh, the monthly job numbers have been pretty good. You know, the monthly job numbers before the pandemic would be in the 100 to 150,000 range, sort of as a steady state, right? Well, we're more than double that uh, in August of this year. So economists look at and say, okay, yes, the, the negative GDP information is from back here. Well, we were creating a ton of jobs and we're still creating a ton of jobs. In August, we created 315,000 jobs, All right? So the economists look at that and say, well, way too early to talk about recession. Now, as I mentioned, um, employment is not back to where it should be in the US economy. This is another graph that shows that the red line is actual level of employment. And so in February of 2020, we had 152 million point five jobs. Uh, and in August of 2022, we had 152.74 million jobs. So we're up about 240,000 relative to where we, to the pre-pandemic level. But again, I don't care so much about that. And this line is my forecast for where employment otherwise might have been. Right, so we're about 6.3 million, million jobs below where I think we should be. So we're making up ground. This gap between the two lines is closing, um, but we're still pretty far away from it. Um, Barry asks, are supply chain issues, Ukraine war, a significant factor in our recent recession? Um, yes, supply chain issues are certainly playing a role. Uh, supply chain issues are, are causing significant delays and increases in costs for producers. Um, and so that raises prices and that causes people to buy less stuff. And that does put a, put a damper on economic growth. Um, the Ukraine war also 
Um, you know, but I, I think we're being, we're feeling the Ukraine war in the United States primarily through um, two paths. One is the price of oil and gas, uh, and the other is the price of food. And I'll talk about both of those things when I talk more deeply um, about inflation. Um, but yes, those, those things certainly matter. Um, I, I might argue that what matters more um, is simply that the, the, the pandemic, as I said, put through a bunch of monkey wrenches into the economy, and it's not quite through doing so, right? So the economy is kind of vacillating all over the place, trying to find its equilibrium. Um, and when things are so uncertain, GDP growth is generally pretty slow. Let's dig a little deeper into uh, the employment recovery. So this graph shows you employment uh, among low wage workers, that's people who make less than $29,000 a year, middle wage workers, those making between $29,000 and $73,000 a year, and high wage workers, those making above $73,000 a year. Now, I'm, and, it, and it shows where employment is in those three groups relative to where it was on January 15 of 2020, right? So relative to pre-pandemic, the number, the, the, the number of low wage workers who are actually employed is down by about 25%. High wage workers are, are also down. Um, that's a relatively recent phenomenon. They did pretty well early on in the pandemic, um, but now seem to be struggling a little bit. And middle wage jobs have bounced back or, and are even a little bit positive. All right, let's focus a little bit on the low wage sector, right? We can look at the percent change in consumer spending Right? The red line is for low-income households, and the blue line is for high-income households. Right? And again, this is percent change since January 15 of 2020. Right? And this red line has consistently been above the blue line, right? meaning that the spending by low-income households has risen faster and more than it has for high-income households. That's kind of surprising when you think about the previous graph that showed that employment among low-income workers was is still down by a quarter. Well, we, we, can, we can fix that by looking at the government spending. Again, there's that $5 trillion that the government threw out in the economy, and they threw a lot of it into the pockets of low-income workers. And so their household balance sheet is pretty good. So they're able to maybe exceed the spending that they otherwise would, would be doing. And they're also able to stay out of the labor force. They're also able to stay at home and not go out and look for a job, right? And part of the reason that they're not doing that is that, you know, this is a little bit anecdote, but, but a lot of low wage workers, when the pandemic set in and they got to stay home for a little while, they got to be rested and they realized that, you know, the working situation before the pandemic was really, really awful, right? So I think a lot of those workers are looking for, uh, looking to get trained into other jobs or lo they're looking for alternatives to their previous work. And so they're staying out. This is uh, the size of the labor force. The green line here is the size of the labor force. And the, the teal line back there, that's kind of the long-term trend. If you go back almost to World War II, that's the long-term trend of the labor force. And this red line is my forecast again, right? So the labor force in February of 2020 was 164.6 million people. Labor force is now 164.7 million people. So we just recovered our pre-pandemic uh, level, but we should have been growing. The economy grows both in population and labor force and economic activity over time. So the labor force, if past is prologue, if past is any indicator of the future, right, then we should have about 168.4 million people in the labor force. We only have 164.7. So we're down 3.7 million, right? So the inevitable question is, well, okay, who is that that's staying out of the labor force? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of 25 to 54 year olds who have exited the labor force, which means that they had a job pre-pandemic, they don't have a job now, and they're not looking. So that's a lot of much of folks aged 25 to 54. And um, that's this gray region here. You put that together with the blue region, and that is 16 to 24 year olds who had a job before the pandemic, but don't have one now and aren't looking. And that explains about 1.4 million of the 3.7 million gap. This green area, that's early retirees. And so that's people aged 55 to 65, or 55 to 64, I guess, who 
uh, otherwise who were in the labor force before the pandemic, but now are not. And, and since they're so close to retirement age, they get categorized as early retirees, though they might come back into the labor force. And there's another 900,000, right? And that's this blue triangle that started out really small and is getting bigger. And that's just a result of the baby boomers, right? So baby boomers are coming out the top end of the labor force. They're coming out, retiring, leaving the labor force in big numbers. And they're almost, you know, so, so exits out the retirement side are generally compensated for by entrance uh, in, on the younger side, right? But since the baby boom is so big and so many of them are retiring now, the inflow is much smaller than the outflow. So that's part of what explains the decline in the labor force. Okay. Another thing is that about 500,000 of the people who are not in the labor force are out of the labor force because they have long COVID symptoms, right? because they have uh, physical ailments because of COVID that don't allow them to go back to work. Right, so employment is still down. Part of what's keeping employment down is the fact that people have left the labor force and are not looking for a job. Right, as you see all the, all the help wanted postings, um, it, it actually started to go away just a little bit. I should have a graph on that, but I'm sorry, I don't. And the number of, of jobs available is down, um, but that's partly because of the uncertainty that's coming. Nobody wants to hire into a recession. Right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. Let's get, get a little start on our inflation conversation. The, the latest numbers that we have for inflation come from August. And this is a graph that I, I stole from the New York Times that showed us that the inflation rate in August was 8.3%. Now, I want to emphasize what that means. That means that on average, prices in the economy increased by 8.3%. But what's really important is that they increased by 8.3% over the course of the last year. Right? There are a lot of people who don't realize it and they think, oh my gosh, in August, prices were 8.3% higher than they were in July. And that's really, really bad inflation. And that's going to cause people to make choices uh, in response to that that they wouldn't make if they understood that it's year over year. Right? Year over year. And in fact, between June and July, prices did not increase at all. The CPI monthly change was zero between June and July. It was also zero between July and August, right? Now, my saying that it's zero doesn't mean that the price of everything held steady. Quite the opposite, right? So here are a list of a bunch of different product categories. Those that had large price increases between July and August, and those that had large price decreases between July and August. Right, so we probably all enjoyed it between July and August when the price of the pump went down. Um, that has turned around, and that, that won't be the case in September because prices are going up, at least in California. Right, airline fares, I confess that's not by my experience, but they're telling me that airline fares fell by 8.8%. Right, at the top end, apparel is up by 1.7%. I have no idea why, but piped utility gas service is up by about 4%. Motor vehicle maintenance is up, electricity, and a lot of the rest of the categories have to do with food, right? Food prices are going up still pretty rapidly. And a big part of that is that we're eating at home and we're not eating in restaurants, which means that the economy still has to adjust to that. Supply chains have to accommodate grocery stores more so and restaurants less so. Well, the economy is a great big cruise ship. It takes time to make that turn. It's also because of the war in Ukraine, right? I, I think we all know that there's a big breadbasket in, uh, in the, the central United States. Well, there's a comparable breadbasket, pardon me, in Russia and Ukraine, right? And since the war, more recently it's changed, but since, uh, since the beginning of the war, very little in the way of, of food stuff has been exported out of Ukraine. And that's forcing prices higher. And it's much more of a problem in a lot of less developed countries than it is in the United States because we frankly spend a pretty small, a relatively small percent of our income on food. In many countries, they spend a much higher percent on food. Here's a, here's a little graph also stolen from the New York Times that, that kind of sums up what's going on in the economy. And it shows you that, that there are aspects of the economy that are bad but getting better. Inflation's in that category. 
uh, and consumer spending sentiment, sorry, is, is sort of in that category. Um, it's also in the bad but getting worse category. So really these two boxes are bad. Uh, on top is getting better and bottom is getting worse. Manufacturing and trade sales, they think is getting worse. Uh, payroll employment uh, is growing. Unemployment claims are down. Industrial product production, right? This is good and getting better. I mentioned how industrial production is strong. Production of capital goods is very strong. The unemployment rate, I don't talk at all about the unemployment rate because I think these days with people coming into and leaving the labor force, the unemployment rate, it turns out, can go up for reasons that are good and it can go down for reasons that are bad. So I don't think it's a very good indicator. Anyway, I include this and you can you can have a look at it if you go and download, download the slides to get a better sense of what, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a way of thinking about the different parts of the economy and how we're doing. So let's take that inflation conversation um, and let's look at some global evidence. Right? What's some global evidence? Here we have inflation in the United States and inflation in, what is that, about eight <laughs> countries that we consider to be peer countries. Right? So you can see that inflation in the Netherlands is quite high at 12%. These are July numbers. Uh, the July number for the US was 8.5. And July numbers for these other countries, uh, for about a half of them, inflation rate numbers are higher. Uh, for the other half, inflation numbers are still high, but less in the United States. And so it's not just a U.S. problem, right? It's a supply chain problem. It's a Ukraine war problem. Um, and it's just a simple, the economy has been thrown out of whack problem, right? And prices are the adjustment mechanism for helping the economy get back into whack, if you will. Um, right. So we're going to see prices that push and pull the economy back into some sort of equilibrium. And, and, and the pandemic had a universal effect. And so coming out of the, the pandemic, it makes some sense that we're all experiencing to a more greater or lesser degree, much the same thing, right? And, and in particular, what we're all experiencing is inflation in the price of imported products. You can see here that, that for, you know, throughout most of 2021 and now 2022, the price of imports have risen on an annual basis, have risen by nine to 10%. Well, why does this really matter? Well, it, it really matters because import, imported products tend to be a source of competition for the economy, right? If uh, Toyota lowers the prices of their cars, then GM, Ford are going to have to, GM, Ford, Chevy, they're going to they're gonna have to follow suit and lower their prices. But if a Toyota gets more and more expensive, then GM and Ford can raise the prices of their cars as well. Right, so with imported with in, the prices of imported products going up, that's relieving co co competition for a lot of domestic producers, allowing them to raise their prices as well. And again, the import imported products, it's not like everybody's just raising the price that they sell imports to us at, but they're raising the price that uh, the folks in Europe are paying as well. All right, okay, so that's inflation. Uh, let's let, oops, don't know what happened there. Um, let's have, have a look at, uh, at what's going on with G GDP. I'm having a problem with my clicker. Let's see. There we go. I'll use a different one. So GDP, as I mentioned in the second quarter of this year, GDP fell by negative 0.6%. Again, that's in an annualized basis. So really on a quarter of a quarter basis, it fell only about 0.15%. Um, in the Netherlands, it's, it's still growing pretty significantly. Spain is doing okay. We expect most of these numbers to be in the 2 to 3% range. Right? When things are going along, fine. Not gangbusters, but fine. GDP growth is in the 2 to 3% range, but it's down in most of the other countries. Uh, the U UK has it down. Um, I think the UK is going to be, is likely headed into a recession because of the, the, the new policies to, endorsed by the new PM. We can talk about that in the chat if you'd like. All right, so just sort of a global summary, right? Developed economies are uniformly down. And it's not entirely a surprise. Right? We're bouncing back from early closures. We did it too rapidly. And so we're kind of swinging from guardrail to guardrail, just a little bit trying to find our economic footing. And we just have so little experience with this type of a global shock that neither economists nor, nor politicians are really very well equipped to deal with it. But since our economies are so inter interconnected, 
it makes sense that they're kind of on a similar cycle and they're experiencing similar things. Right? It is somewhat surprising because responses to the pandemic were very different. Right? Some countries put a lot of stimulus out. The United States is high there. Other countries didn't put very much out. Most put out some significant stimulus, so that was a common theme. Supply chains are common to all of us. And shifts of purchases from services to goods was also a common theme. Right? And that shift I'll show it to you in a minute. That shift was really important because it takes a while for the economic shift to turn to provide all of the goods that people want. So we get inflation from that shift from services to goods. Um, also, it, it, I, I mentioned uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and their effect on the supply of microchips. Well, it turns out that you know, goods need microchips much more than services do. So part of the shortage of, of microchips is, is because demand is, is so high, both from cryptocurrencies um, and because everybody ran out and bought a Peloton and there are lots of microchips in a Peloton or other things that require a Peloton. And that was common across countries. And now we're all engaged in kind of a common shift back. That's why so many countries look so similar in terms of inflation and GDP. All right, let's dig a little bit further into just inflation in the United States. What have we been experiencing? Well, this is, this is the same data that was put up uh, in that graph from the New York Times. That graph in the New York Times went back through history. Um, I meant to point out how it's been so long since we've ex experienced inflation this high. You have to go back to the 1980s uh, to when we experienced inflation this high. Um, but this is what's happened. Uh, this is looking back in the early days of the pandemic. Um, the Federal Reserve really likes inflation to be about 2%. They target 2% inflation, try to hold that steady. Well, in the early days of the pandemic, prices were a little bit lower than 2%. They were growing at less than 2%, um, which you know, was fine by the Federal Reserve, but it means that you know, as we're doing year over year comparisons, uh, when prices started going up, the, we were comparing what we were experiencing with very low price levels. So early on, that was part of what was going on, right? And then inflation started to pick up steam. And now, right, the April 22 number that's com being compared with the April, April 21 number, well, the April 21 number wasn't so low anymore. So we're getting more sort of genuine inflation into the system. It's been relatively constant for the last four or five months. Um, and in the last couple of months, it came down a bit, which has me optimistic and hopeful uh, that we're starting to get inflation under control. Gas prices are cert certainly starting to, to become under control, uh, although uh, I, I think since this, these data came out uh, on September 26, we've seen a bit of an increase in the price at the pump. But nationwide, gas prices peaked at about $5 a gallon. Um, they're now down to $3.7 a gallon, except in California. I, know, I don't know about where you are, but I pay over $6 a gallon. Um, and, and part of that high price and part of the increase in price that we're experiencing is because of some difficulties at West Coast refineries. Um, that's reducing supply and driving up prices. Right? A lot of people, when we got up to 5%, oh my gosh, uh, we've never seen $5 a gallon gas before. It was, got, it was really scary. Right? The highest was just over, previous experience was just over $4 a gallon. Right? But this is nominal gas prices. Remember early on, I talked about nominal means is not adjusted for inflation. So if we turn this into real gas prices, we get this line, right? So, you know, the economy has been up to $5 a gallon. It didn't stay that, very, that way very long. Um, here it flirted with $5 a gallon for a while, but, uh, you know, it was okay back then um, and it'll be okay now, especially that prices are coming back down. Prices are still elevated. This is the CPI, Consumer Price Index, the, the number that we've been talking about. And this is the price index for fuel. And it turns out that fuel year over year is still growing at about 50%, 48.8%. That rate of increase is coming down. So hopefully fuel prices will continue to come down as well. We can look a little bit about food costs, right? Food costs continue to rise. Um, this is, uh, again, the navy blue line is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. That's about 8.2 or 8.3. And the red line is the change in inflation in food. And as you can see, the trajectory of that line has just been up. Although it started to slow for overall, it hasn't really started to slow for food. Right? So food is uh, inflation rate is 
Now, it's interesting uh, that, that inflation in food for, bought for use at home is much higher than it is for food bought away from home, right? And, and that's because there's, there's a general increase in the price of food, right? But at a restaurant, food makes up a much smaller part of the restaurant's overall cost, right? So its contribution to rising prices is going to be less than food that you buy for use at home. Right, because food, that's that's the primary cost when you buy it at the grocery store. So that helps to explain why food at home is, prices are growing faster than, than food in the restaurant prices. All right, so let's let's step back a little bit and think about what it is that drives inflation. How does it work? All right, well, there are really two primary types of inflation that economists talk about. And there's a bunch of built-in stuff in the economy that tends to reinforce inflationary uh, potential. Right, so the first one that we talk about is called demand pull. Remember how I talked about everybody buying goods and services, buying a Peloton uh, instead of, I've been, I, I said buying goods and services, buying goods rather than services. Right, so people started buying stuff rather than services. Right? My haircut is a, is a result of the pandemic. My girlfriend started cutting my hair and well, it looks okay. And now I don't have to spend 50 bucks a month. Um, so, but, but the increase in demand for goods really drove up the price of goods. And that's demand sort of pulling prices up. I'll show you that in just a minute. And there's a way that prices get pushed up, right? We've been talking, I've been talking a fair bit about microchips, right? Well, the price of microchips is going up. And if the price of microchips goes up, just like the price of helium driving up the price of helium balloons, goes, drives up the price of helium balloons, the price of microchips going up will drive up the price of everything that uses a microchip. And what uses a microchip? Well, pretty much everything, right? So it's putting up, it's got a pretty broad brushed uh, influence on prices going up. Other built influences are things like wages, right? If you're an employee and your wages don't go up, but you see that prices are going up eight or 9% uh, year over year, then you realize that, you know, since your wages didn't go up, your real or your inflation adjusted income has in fact gone down, right? So you might go into your boss's office and say, hey boss, my real income is going down, I need a raise. And the boss might give you a raise because that's reasonable. Um, but since the boss gave you a raise, now the boss is gonna have to adjust the prices of whatever product, product it is that you're making so that they can pay for that raise and recoup those costs. So asking for a, a, a raise comes from inflation but asking for and getting a raise can actually contribute to ongoing inflation. Let me talk a little bit more about demand pull and cost push, right? So this is, this is to help illustrate demand pull. Um, and the red line here, that is the growth in purchases of goods. The blue line is the growth in purchases of services, right? And this is February of 2020, right before the pandemic. March, April of 2020, we fell off a cliff. We started, stopped buying most things, goods and services. Right? But goods started rebounding much before and much faster than did the purchase of services, right? To the point where we were about 20% above where we were before the pandemic, right? And that's demanding a lot of the economy, a lot of producers. It's demanding a lot of producers to get them to change what they make to accommodate that shift away from services, because services remained below where they had been until early this year, right? And now we've got goods spending up 14.3% and coming down, and we've got services spending up 0.7% and going up, right? So whenever there are rapid changes whether it's goods going, goods purchases going up or goods purchases going down, whenever there are rapid changes in demand like that, you're going to get inflation as industry tries to keep up with what people want. Uh, a couple of questions in the chat. Lois said, what is a source of valid economic information? New York Times, Wall Street Journal, something else? Um, yeah, I think the, you know, the New York Times is a, is a good source. The Wall Street Journal is a good source. Um, for both of them, don't take uh, economic information from the editorial pages because they both have their, their perspective. Um, but yes, those are good. Uh, the Economist uh, news magazine is also very good. Peter asks, can we expect continuous growth long-term 
and plan for continuous growth long-term if the planet cannot sustain such long-term growth in numbers of people or in available resources or environmental consequences? Um, that is a, a very deep and important question, Peter. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that off until, uh, until we have our, our, our 15 minutes at the end to chat about stuff. Um, let me, let me finish up with inflation and we'll talk a little bit about policy and then we can go into that bigger, bigger picture question. All right, um, so that's demand pull, right? When the economy's out of whack, you've got demand pulling it in various directions and that's gonna lead to inflation. We've got these, uh, these different markets uh, that represent cost push, right? So over here, this 159, that is the index from which the, the inflation rate is calculated. So this is the consumer price index. Um, and this green is uh, a, an index of building materials inflation. This is largely lumber, because when the pandemic set in, pretty much every lumber yard all over the world just stopped. Hit the off button on the saws and no more lumber came out. So we've had shortages of lumber sort of off and on throughout the, the pandemic and the recovery. The point where you know prices of lumber, uh, prices of building materials are, are now elevated to the tune of about 50% relative to where they were pre-pandemic. So that's significantly, significantly elevated. And then used car prices, right? So used car prices are up and that's driven by cost push. That's driven by the shortage and the high prices on microchips, right? Because during the pandemic, people still had to drive and old cars still died, necessitating people to buy a new one, a new one or a used one, but an, addition, a, a, an additional car, right? Since there weren't very many new cars on the market because of the microchip issue, uh, and because the price of new cars went up quite a lot, people turned to the used car market. And we got about, you know, about a one third increase in the price of used cars. It's a pretty significant rise. Sheriff uh, says, I understand that housing makes up to close to 40% of the CPI and that rents are rising, but their inflationary effect tends to lag because of leases. You just talk about prospective inflation due to housing costs. Um, yeah, sure. I, I, that 40% seems high to me, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, housing is, is certainly significant um, in the CPI, um, and, but I think that over time, you know, over the course of the next year, it's going to be less and less of um, a high price pressure uh, on the CPI, right? Because rents are not growing as rapidly. Rent, as, as new leases are now turning over, um, rent is not going up as rapidly as it had been, um, and home prices are also coming down. And home prices, the price of owned homes, is also a factor in calculating housing's contribution to the CPI. So I expect that it has been a significant influence, but I expect it to be less so going forward. All right, and then we could talk about supply chains, right? Here's an index put out by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, the, when, when this index is below zero, that means there's a lot of slack in the, in the supply chain. That means that there's plenty of room on ships. There are plenty of containers available. When that number gets above one, all the way up here to, to four, that means that there's not very much room on the ships or there aren't very many containers available. So that slows things down and it raises prices. Right, slowing things down also raise costs of manufacturers, right? If they're having to sit and wait for microchips, that imposes a cost on them that has inflationary pressure. And you can see we're down from over 4%, 4 uh, down to about one and a half, right? And I am hopeful and optimistic that that trend is going to continue, right? So this is another aspect of cost push. Right now, the Federal Reserve prefers a different measure of inflation, um, hmm, I'm not sure why this graph didn't update to August. Well, what happened in August, and it happened just on Friday, um, was that this number went up again. And it sent for, for those of you that watch the stock markets, it sent the stock markets tumbling on Friday. Um, there's another measure, it's, it's the personal consumption expenditure price index. It's the one that the Federal Reserve almost exclusively looks at. Um, it's always been lower than the CPI, um, which might explain why the Federal Reserve didn't act quite as quickly as it might have. Right, so let's, let me sum up sort of my diagnosis for the uptick inflation, and we'll have a little conversation about policy. Right, spending patterns have changed dramatically, pulling, yanking the economy this way and that. And when things yank the economy this way and that, 
you're going to get inflation because things are out of equilibrium and the pressure is there for prices to rise. There were lots of supply chain issues uh, that affected many areas of the economy, in particular computer chips. And as I mentioned, computer chips go into most things. So that had pretty broad, broad reach in terms of inflationary effect in the economy. Also too much total spending. And I, 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 lots of people talk about this, but I'm not sure um, how big a contributor that was to inflation. I mean, it's more the, the dramatic change in spending patterns towards goods rather than services and now back towards services, I think. This is a worry for a lot of economists. The federal stimulus, as I mentioned, we put about $5 trillion out in the economy. Turns out there's about $2 trillion worth of excess savings. So the worry amongst many economists is that, well, if people decide to spend that money all at once, then that's going to be enormously inflationary, right? That's a, that can be a 10% increase in demand relative to GDP, right? And the strong retail sales certainly seem to suggest that people are prepared to spend it. And as I mentioned earlier, consumer spending appears to be running pretty strong. Who's to blame, right? Um, there's always this tendency to want to blame somebody or what's the culprit. And, you know, I, if, if anybody or thing or is going to be blamed, I just blame the pandemic, right? And, and maybe our inability to dial in the economy that we want. Right? Our economy is very dynamic. It responds in ways that we don't necessarily understand. Um, and when we spend money like the ARP, uh, the American uh, Recovery Plan. Um, you know, sometimes we don't spend it as well as we might, and we end up exacerbating uh, things uh, maybe outside of what we were trying to fix. Right? And in terms of inflation, uh, I think the Fed could have could have acted sooner. Uh, I wish the Fed had acted sooner, but I confess that when the Fed wasn't acting, I was supportive of that. Um, so I hate I hesitant to, hesitate to be too critical. What's going to happen with inflation going forward? <clears throat> well. There are two kinds of treasuries that you can buy. You can buy treasuries that do not adjust for inflation. So if you buy it and it says it's gonna give you a 5% interest rate, you're gonna get a 5% interest rate, right? There's another type of treasury that does adjust for inflation. And if you buy it, it's gonna give you a 5% rate of return, which means that the principal on the treasury is gonna expand if inflation grows. So you're going to get that 5% interest regardless of what happens with inflation. All right, well, there's always a gap between those two types of treasuries. If you're going to buy an unprotected treasury, they're going to have to pay you a higher rate of interest because there's more risk than if you buy an inflation-protected treasury. And the reason I'm talking about these is because that gap is often used as a measure of the market's expectation for inflation. Right, and that's pretty good news because it shows us that over the course of the next five years, the red line, the market expects inflation to be down around 2.1%. And then over the next 10 years, the blue line, the market similarly thinks that inflation will be you know, in the neighborhood of 2%, right? So part of the reason the Fed is acting as, as urgently as it is, and I'll show you what they're doing in just a minute, they're, they're acting now strongly to send a message that inflation isn't going to be baked into the economy. Because right? people think that inflation is going to last for a long time, they're going to make decisions that will tend to exacerbate inflation. They'll go into their bosses and say, boss, give me a raise. And boss, if boss is expecting a lot of inflation, boss is going to be more predisposed to give the raise. Right? And that's going to exacerbate inflation. Whereas if we can keep expectations for inflation down, then it's possible to keep actual inflation down as well. Right, so I've mentioned the Fed, what is the Fed doing about it? Well, the primary means of influence is through the federal funds rate. Now the federal funds rate, that's set by the Federal Reserve and it's the interest rate that banks charge each other overnight to lend each other money. Right, now why do banks lend each other money overnight? It's because the Federal Reserve has said that at the end of every day, every single day, you have to have reserves on hand that are equal to a certain percent of your, your deposits. And so if you have less than that at the end of the day, you got to borrow from some bank that has excess reserves. And right? so they lend to each other, right? Well, the, the Fed has raised it from zero. Early on in the pandemic, they just dropped the, the federal funds rate right down to zero. They've raised it in successive uh, 
uh, increases up to 2.25 and now up to 3% just a week and a half or so ago. Right, so the federal funds rate has gone from zero to three percent, and the implications of that increase in the federal funds rate is that it increases costs to banks, and then banks in turn raise interest rates for investments, for home loans. I'll show you that in a minute. For car loans, credit cards, the interest rate on treasuries go go up. The interest rate on your savings account might well go from 0.1 percent up to 0.2 percent. You get just a little bit of a bump, and not that that's really here nor there. And, and virtually all of the other interest rates in the economy are affected. Here, let's take a look at what's going on with U.S. Treasuries, right? So, you know, here was where inflation kind of set in and the Federal, Federal Reserve started raising interest rates. Well, the, Federal, the, the interest rate on U.S. Treasuries has gone up very significantly. We can look at mortgage rates, right? Again, it was in, in, this, in this period where the Federal, Federal Reserve started increasing rates and mortgage rates tick up in tandem with it along with uh, the federal funds rate, right? So kind of takeaways, uh, is there a recession on the horizon going back to that conversation? I don't see one. You know, Larry Summers, who's a really smart guy, Jamie Dimon, uh, the head of JP Morgan Chase, and Elon Musk, they're all worried about a recession. But you know, I've given, given up worrying about what Elon Musk says. I gave up, that up a long time ago. Um, I do think the chances of slipping into a recession have increased. But I, I think the economy is doing quite well. Consumers are spending money. We're creating a lot of jobs. Um, why did we get the negative GDP? We got the negative GDP largely, well, oops, pardon me, largely uh, because of inventories. It's an inventory story. It's not a structural issue in the economy. Producers made a mistake um, and now they're correcting for that mistake. Right? We've benefited from it on the upside in terms of big GDP number, and we're suffering from it on the downside in terms of a, a small GDP number. Right? That doesn't mean that there's anything to be fixed or necessarily worried about. Right? Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the role of policy. You know, did it get us into this mess? Hmm, I, I think it may have exacerbated the mess a little bit. Uh, the, as I mentioned, you yes, through through $5 trillion dollars uh, into the economy. There remains $2 trillion in excess savings, and that excess the two trillion in excess savings could well keep the economy out of equilibrium for a little bit longer, and it could contribute to inflation. Right? What role did local shutdowns play? I don't know, and economists will be looking at that and studying it in great gory detail for the next few years. What role did the nature of business support play? Right? If any of you remember the, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, right? it wasn't administered very effectively early on, so a lot of small businesses that needed it didn't get access to it. Right, so we've got a lot of small business closures, and that's got our economy a little bit out of work, out of, out of, out of equilibrium. You know, was it determined by policies or natural fear and self-preservation, right? Um, we bought more goods rather than services because we buy things to make our happy, ourselves happy. Going to restaurants, not possible. Uh, so we got our happiness out of goods. Um, leaving the labor force. A lot of people, as I talked about, still out of the labor force. We're starting to bounce back. Uh, we bounced back initially too optimistically and uh, aggressively. Um, maybe we were too optimistic and aggressive in the fourth quarter of last year's. I really think this is just mostly the natural, stru natu natural struggles of an economy uh, <coughs> responding to changes. Um, did politicians get us into this mess? Uh, a little bit, maybe. Um, too much untargeted spending. But how should we think about that? You know, I, the politicians often have two choices. They can do things quickly and try to fix things, or they can take their time and try to fix things exactly right. Well, they operated quickly this time. They didn't do things as best as, as, as well as they might have, but operating quickly was, I think, extremely important. So I, for one, forgive them for not getting things exactly right. If they had waited, um, then the economy might have tanked much further uh, and they might have missed the window of opportunity. Right. Haste does times, sometimes make waste, um, but it also sometimes pays off in the end. All right, really, there's just a, a, a lot of blame to throw around, throw around. Economists, you know, just don't, economies just don't respond very well to significant shocks like this. And finally, you know, can politicians get us out of this mess? Um, well, no. Uh, politicians have really no, very little role to play um, in terms of getting the economy back, back into equilibrium. They have very little role to play uh, in terms of reducing inflation, 
right? We could put on price controls, but I think nobody probably wants that. And that would probably just slow down our trajectory, slow down the rate at which we get back to equilibrium, right? We're left with the Federal Reserve acting, you know, decisively and aggressively, um, which seems to be paying off somewhat, but not quite as much uh, as we might like. Bottom line, right, politicians did what they felt was necessary. They also did the best that they could and give them a lot of credit for that. Um, I did a lot of bad mouthing of them early on, but, but in hindsight, I think they did did, and did important things. Right, the pandemic threw enormous spanners into the works of the economy, and neither politicians nor economists are particularly well equipped to deal with that sort of thing. We just don't experience it on the scale that we did very often. Right. Blaming anybody for the actions or inactions, I don't think is reasonable as a pandemic and bad things were going to happen. Um, policy influenced which bad things are going to happen. I think that it improved things. Um, but to, to, to look at our politicians today and say, well, why aren't you stepping in and fixing things? Well, it's because it's not clear how to do that. Again, we're left with the Federal Reserve doing the best that it can and with being generally patient. It's going to take some time. It may well take three to five years for us to really genuinely get back to equilibrium. But we'll get there, and I'm, I'm confident that, they, that their equilibrium in the next couple of years will be a good place. Okay, that's what I have. Um, just a reminder to come back next week for Trevor O'Grady on climate change economics. I think that's a really good and informative talk. It, it really is helpful in terms of how do you think about a lot of the different policy options that are out there for dealing with climate change. All right, and here's, here's how to contact me. If you go and download the slides, uh, the link to which I'll send to, uh, to Lois, um, you can get this information and uh, please feel free to, to reach out if you like. There's also another part of the NEEDS website that has local graphs. If, if you wanna see how things are going uh, down in uh, Santa Cruz, um, you can go there and it'll show you what's going on with employment, with work from home, with a wide variety of different statistics. All right, let me stop sharing. Uh, and uh, good, you all seem to be there. Um, let me ch check the chat. What didn't I cover in the chat? So Rab Rabia put in the chat, uh, uncontrollable causes of housing increases, like investment corporations continuing to buy up housing around the US and increasing house prices and rents can have unexpected effects on the economy. Um, it, it can, it certainly can. Um, you know, but, but those effects can also be overstated. Um, housing is an important part of the economy, but it's not a huge part, right? Consumption, which does not include the purchase of, of housing, um, uh, again, is about two thirds of the economy. So it, it matters, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's really just another case of, of uh, economic actors doing what economic actors do. And, and you can say that you don't like it um, and, we can, and we can enact policies that, that slow it down, um, but it's really kind of just a natural progression of the economy. And Linda put in there, it seems that TV media likes to target the negatives of today's economy. Well, Linda, I think TV today likes to target the negatives of most things. Um, I, I know there's, a, there's an online publication out there that is de devoted to, to talking about only positive stories. And, and the only reason we have that is because most of the, the, the popular media, the, the more, or I hate to use this term, but the more mainstream media does tend to focus on the negative. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't like it when after two quarters of negative growth, all the newspapers start saying, oh, we're going into recession because that scares people, it scares people that make decisions that are more likely to push us into a recession. Um, but, you know, not, nothing I can do about that other than, other than talk to folks like you uh, about what uh, economists think. All right. That, that's what I have. Um, we've still got another <clears throat> 12 minutes or so. Um, anybody else have any other questions about what's going on with the economy? Any any thoughts or or doubts about uh, some of the things that, that I've mentioned? I, I'm always delighted to hear those because uh, it helps me learn and think harder about what I'm saying. Okay, if you have uh, a question, feel free, feel free to just unmute yourself or maybe maybe raise your hand. Uh, 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 probably with the raise the hand function, uh, and that way you'll go into my upper left hand corner, and I'll see you right away. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Rabia Arabia, I apologize for mispronouncing your name, uh, wants me to talk more about cryptocurrency. Um, let's, let's see if we can clear the decks a little bit more on the economy, uh, and then maybe I'll talk a little bit more about cryptocurrency. Okay, can, can you hear me, John? Yeah, I can hear you, Barry, yep. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask one. So there, 
there are some people who claim that a piece of inflation is that the the companies are taking this opportunity to increase their profit margins. Yeah. Is that a factor? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's definitely some of that going on, right? Um, you know, part of, if you go back to what I was saying about import prices, the fact that import prices are going up pretty rapidly, that's allowing domestic companies to raise their prices in excess of what their costs might dictate. Um, and and it, it's also clear that, that even imported prices aside, a lot of companies are taking this opportunity, right? You know, consumers won't notice if we go an extra two or three percent higher because you know they're seeing prices go up, and and this is just be more of the same. Uh, if you look at corporate profits during the pandemic, they have gone up quite a lot. Um, and thank you for mentioning that. I really should keep the the graph, put the put a graph on corporate profits into my slides because um, it, it it makes a pretty compelling case that you know, uh, corporate profits are going up. Um, and another cause of that might be because a lot of small businesses have gone out of business, right? And to the extent that they're competing with corporations, um, you know, they're going out. The small business is going away has reduced competition, also allowing these, these bigger companies to to raise their profits and prices. Uh, any other questions or comments about the economy? Well, All right, I can, I, I, sorry, Barry. If people are going to be shy, I go back to that question on uh, unlimited growth. Uh, All right, the question on unlimited growth. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, I don't, GDP is the measure that we have most available. Um, it's the measure that we use most often, but it's real downside, it's real failing is that there is no element of sustainability, right? What we really need is a measure of growth, a measure of GDP that says, okay, we used a lot of Earth's resources this quarter. That means there's gonna be less available coming. One that reflects perhaps the fact that population growth, if it takes off, it could reflect that and give us a sense for you know, how we're doing in terms of keeping up with, with changes. Um, so, yeah, uh, GDP as a primary measure is also a further driver of activities that grow GDP, right? Because that's what Congress is focused on. That's what governments are focused on. And so that's what we're going to get. And so, you know, for a variety of re reasons, I'm not a fan. And I don't think that it serves us well over the long term. Now, I, th all that said, I, I am an optimist. Um, and I am optimistic that, you know, regardless of the use of GDP as a measure, uh, that over the long term, we will find ways of expanding GDP, of making much, much better use of our resources that, you know, that will dramatically extend the amount of time that we uh, have left with resources. Not, 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 not meaning to imply that it's, it's short. I'm not, an, I'm, I'm not an end of days person. Um, but uh, we are pretty good at figuring out how to use what we use more efficiently. A little bit of a long-winded answer. I hope it was helpful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, well, I have one more. All right, People great. Are here. So, um, the big question is, who was hurt worst in this? I mean, poor people or rich people, basically what it comes down to. I mean, it seems that I mean, when you have inflation, the economic approach to, to somehow slow down the economy, but that seems to target the people who are most hurt by the slow down economy. So this seems to be the... the uh, the difficulty economists have in a way of fixing things without hurting the people most, the class that can least afford to be hurt. Right, and, and, and we do tend to focus on big picture and not nearly enough on distributional impacts. You know, I think this, this particular set of inflation has been enormously painful um, for low wage workers, much, much less so for the well-to-do. Um, if we if if we do 
yeah, I, I don't think we're going to experience any sort of a downturn like we did in the early 80s when Paul Volcker really put the brakes on the economy. I don't think we're going to experience that. Um, I think that it will, you know, if we really do try to things, change things, I think, you, think you're right that it will likely hurt, uh, again, the low income groups. Um, but hopefully it's a good long term, A, hopefully it's a good long term investment in them, right? Maybe a little bit more pain now, but, but better off in the future. Uh, as well, you know, they, they're still low work, low wage workers are still holding a lot of that excess $2 trillion in savings. Um, so in this particular period of inflation and, and policies that combat inflation, um, low wage, the low wage community is better equipped to deal with it than they might otherwise be. All right. I'm, I'm, oh, there's another question in the chat. Um, has the Fed wound down all the QE money pumped into the economy around 2008? Uh, why did this fiscal stimulus not create inflation? Uh, I've been expecting inflation since then. Um, no, no. Um, you know, in fact, the, the Fed was starting to wind things down um, as we were going into the pandemic. Uh, they were starting to, to sell off a bunch of the treasuries that they had accumulated, um, but they didn't get very far. Uh, before actually the, the economy started to appear to turn, and then we went into the pandemic. So the Fed has um, now, I think, about $7 trillion worth of treasuries on the books. And that's an, that's an enormous amount of stimulus into the economy. So, so it's not that surprising that we're getting inflation now, and it is a little surprising. And, and many, many economists are surprised that we didn't get more inflation um, over the course of the last decade. Now, part one of the explanations for why we didn't get inflation over the course of the last decade is just what happened to that money that was pumped into the economy. And a lot of the money that was pumped into the economy it was, wasn't pumped into the pockets of poor folks. It wasn't pumped into the pockets of the middle class. It was pumped into the pockets of the well-to-do. Right? And the well-to-do don't go out and spend it the way that the middle and lower classes do. Uh, so we didn't get... The, the increase in aggregate demand that we might have expected because of the distributional effect. And since we didn't get that increase in aggregate demand, we didn't get the inflation that I think it was perfectly reasonable to expect. Right. Any other questions? If not, then I'll, I'll spend a couple of minutes on, on cryptocurrencies. Oh, Kathy, did you have a question? Do you want to unmute yourself, please? Kathy, you're muted. I can't hear you. Oh, just lost your video. Yeah. Nancy, did you have something? Yeah, I have a question about what you just said. I mean, wasn't the outcome of that also greater income inequality? Oh, for sure. So government policy does indeed change social the society oh oh government policy is economic policy government yeah it, it, it is it is it, regulatory policy yes and for the court for the we have a really good talk on income inequality that shows that it's been increasing for the last 40 years um and 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 that's really a quasi-conscious choice that we as a people are making Right? We keep electing people to government offices who are inclined to pursue policies that worsen income inequality to the point where income inequality now is uh, worse than it was in the roaring 20s. Um, it's, as, it's as bad as it has been in the history of our collection of uh, data that allows us to calculate in inequality. So yes, inequality is on the rise. Inequality is a source. We, we also got slower GDP growth over the course of the last decade than we might have expected, right? And it's not immediately clear, but some would suggest that that's partly because of the increase in income inequality. Those who want to spend the money don't have it. Inequality at, at low levels is a very important motivating force for the economy. Inequality at high levels um, is is detrimental to to economic growth. But when you get into it's being because we elect people 
then you get into the whole question of the system of elections. Mm -hmm. You get into the whole question of the system of elections, and, and part of the reason why I'm here is because you start to wonder about whether or not the electorate understands that they're electing people who are going to pursue policies that, that increase income inequality. Because right? that's complicated. It is very complicated. That's complicated both because the underlying economics are complicated, but it's also complicated because of the marketing that's used. Right? Think about right to work laws. Right? That sounds great. Everybody should have the right to work, but those real laws are really intended to undercut unions. Right? And the fact that unions have been undercut and, and the percent of the, the, the labor force that does unionize has gone down from about 30% down to about 8%. Right? Unions just don't matter in the way that they used to. And wages in the bottom half of the income distribution are suffering because of it. Uh, let's see. Oh, and so all right. Let me spend, spend a minute or two uh, on cryptocurrencies. Uh, Rabia says specifically, can you explain how cryptocurrency affects in, inflation? Did you say it was the blockchain and chips? Um, so specifically how it's been affecting inflation now is because yes, it's microchips, right? People are buying you know, massive quantities of computers. The only use of which is to do math, to get the outcome of a math equation right, right? That's, that's called you know, my cryptocurrency mining. Very, very energy intensive, pardon me. <laughs> very energy intensive and and the amount um of emissions that come from cryptocurrency mining um is is is, is equivalent to the amount of energy and pollution that's generated by thailand um in a given year right so it's very very energy intensive it's microchip intensive it raises the prices of microchips, which raises the prices of virtually everything else in the economy. That's the primary conduit towards to inflation. Uh, another thing that I'll, that I'll add about cryptocurrencies is that most economists are skeptical and worry about them, right? Because there's, there's no fundamental underlying value. Let me repeat that. There is no fundamental underlying value. There is underlying value of cash because it can always be used to pay your taxes, right? So there's always an underlying value of cash. There's an underlying value of gold because it's used for a wide variety of industrial purposes, right? The only reason there's value in cryptocurrencies, the only reason its price goes up or it goes down is because of really animal spirits, right? Because somebody in the market says it should go up or somebody says it goes down or Matt Damon puts out a commercial saying, you don't understand it, so what? Go buy some. Um, I don't understand fundamentally what's happening in the markets. I don't understand fundamentally why prices go up and why prices go down. Um, and, and I don't understand the long-term contribution that cryptocurrencies are going to make. They are pushing governments to invest in electronic currencies, right? And that will serve as a benefit going forward. But I don't think the cryptocurrencies themselves, right, because, because they're enormous volatility. And um, there have been some governments that have, that have you know, turned to cryptocurrencies enormously, but they pay a huge price for it. It's just not a good idea. Right? So I don't fully understand the, the value proposition behind crypto. I know it's made a lot of people rich. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably made a lot of people poor too. That's my that's my two minutes on on cryptocurrencies. Uh, why are digital currencies a benefit? Well, so so there's there's friction in our system. Um, it takes money longer than it should to get from here to there, right? Uh, so if 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 I tell my bank um, I want to pay a thousand dollars on my credit card, this is going to take two or three days for that money to get from my bank to my credit card. When in reality, we have the technology, so that should just be instant. Why does it do, take two or three days? It takes two or three days because the bank wants to hold on to that money for a little while and get the interest on it while you're waiting, right? You know, it would be valuable if we had a, a, another payment system that was very fluid, right? And, and cryptocurrencies are not very fluid. 
right? They take time and they cost money, right? Somebody has to pay for all of this, this uh, the, the, the mining and for all of these computers, right? So transactions in, in cryptocurrencies are not costless. And the further we get into it, the more costly it's going to be, right? The rate of transactions that, are, that happen in cryptocurrencies is like a, like a one, one ten thousandth of the rate of transactions with a, with a credit card. So the systems for managing cryptocurrency transactions, they're just not very fast and nimble. So it's not gonna serve as a very good um, instrument for quick transactions going, going forward. Um, I apologize, I do have to go. Um, so it's, it's been fun. Thank you all for tuning in and I hope that you'll come back next week uh, and Trevor O'Grady will be here with, uh, with what, what I, I think you'll, you'll appreciate as, a, as a, an important climate change economics talk. And I will see you all, I hope, in about three weeks when I come back to talk about autonomous vehicles. Do come for that. It's a really, it's a really fun talk. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, in the meantime, please be well. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank Take you. care. Thank you, John. You bet. Thank you. Yep. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank Take you. care, everybody.